I'll tell you a work cough injury. Tennis elbow. Sounds weird, huh? Who plays tennis here? Anybody? Not too many tennis players. How many of you have taken care of or have patients with tennis elbow conditions? Look at all those hands. Does it sound paradoxical? Tennis elbow work comp? Is that feasible? Any of you had approval for that as a work comp case? You have. Mm. It doesn't seem like a tennis elbow condition would be work comp, but in fact, it really, I find that it's not uncommon. It's in fact quite common. Uh, uh, most people, interestingly, that uh, get tennis elbow are not tennis players. In fact, I get excited when a tennis player comes in with a tennis elbow. Most patients are, you know, homemakers, plumbers, you know, laborers. So we don't see too many people with tennis elbow, but it got the name back in 1880 when the British uh, Medical Journal published a paper on lawn tennis elbow, lawn. They played tennis at that time on, on lawn, and, uh, and so they called it tennis. Uh, so this name has stuck for the last 130 years, uh, but most people don't have tennis. But I want to uh, review a little bit of the causation. First, before I give up my tennis elbow, most tennis players who get tennis elbow just have a bad backhand. <laughs> for whatever reason they do, I'm not a great tennis player, they just, the backhand is the one that stresses the lateral aspect of the elbow where the particular tendon is attached to it called excessive carpi radialis brevis. That's why I used to try to use both hands. But I'm not here to give you a lesson on tennis. But I will give you a little information about tennis elbow. Excuse me, what's your name? <laughs> Excuse me, are you one of the case managers? Can you come up? What, what's your name? Lena, you're nicely dressed for us. Thank you very much. This is Lena. She's one of the case managers here. So I, I want to demonstrate uh, tennis elbow uh, on, on Lena. How do you diagnose it? It's really a common condition. We see it across the board. I had it briefly, uh, and I know many of you who don't want to admit it probably had it briefly, but it went away with some ansets. This condition occurs with repetitive activities or overzealous uh, activities where the tendons attached to the elbow that particularly extend the wrist attached to the lateral aspect of the elbow. May I have your... Thank you. No, no, no. I get 45 minutes. I forgot to tell you. Okay. <laughs> So, so what happens here is that there's generally pain right in the lateral aspect of the elbow, directly over the lateral condyle and just distal to it. They also have pain with resistive extension of the wrist and middle finger. So extend your wrist and your middle finger, keep it up real strong, and when you do this provocative test, they generally uh, uh, tell you that they're having pain in the lateral aspect of the elbow. In fact, they jump, they go, whoa, whoa, don't do that, doctor. And also, uh, uh, one of the things you want to do is palpate just distal to that, right where the postinchoasis nerve is, between what's called the extensor digitrum commodus and, uh, and the radial wrist extensors. And they tend to be tender right here if they have radial tunnel syndrome. Why am I bringing that up? Because I think it's missed often. This is one of the reasons why lateral condylitis has a bad name. If you miss that, then the symptoms are going to continue because you're not treating that. And the literature talks about having a coexisting five to 50% of the time. That's a big span. But I suspect that it's somewhere between five to 10%, okay? But you need to know whether they have that or not. Uh, otherwise, uh, their symptomology will continue. The other thing you want to always test is uh, resistive supination. So you want them to supinate the forearm against resistance. If they have pain, that's an indication that the radial uh, tunnel, where the nerve, posterior nerve goes through the supinator, is compressed called radial tunnel syndrome. Okay, so at minimal you want to examine them for both the lateral condylitis and the radial tunnel syndrome. Many other conditions can exist concomitantly. For example, arthritis of the elbow, hence why we need to get an x-ray. 95% of the time the x-rays are negative, but we still need to get them because it would be quite embarrassing three months later to find out, oh, by the way, you got radial capitular arthritis. Uh, EMGs I don't get. Uh, I know that oftentimes my work comp colleagues say, 
no, we want you to go for EMG to rule out radial tunnel syndrome. That's nonsense. We just wasted $1,200, okay? It's negative. It's false negative almost always, uh, always, and I don't recommend it. But oftentimes when they go for IME, because of our fellow IME doctors, would like to get a EMG because they need to make recommendation. Well, I think it's it, it doesn't help because it's really a clinical diagnosis rather than the EMG diagnosis. So I, I don't recommend that. But the good news is that these conditions can be cured. Um, oh, by the way, thank you. That, that was my wife, Lena. Uh, she didn't know I was going to use her as a model. Last time I used the model was her brother. He's a very handsome fella, uh, ripped, and I had him uh, 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 stand in front of 70 hand therapists, all women except one gay guy, and uh, and and he he was like the hit of the of the of the gathering, and as he took off his shirt, his tank top, and I was going to talk about brachial plexus. I always like to use models because I really feel that that three dimensional thing, especially if they're good looking, makes a difference. And uh, one therapist uh, was whispering that we should we should get some music now. So uh, that was a little embarrassing. He turned red, and I and he was gonna walk away. And I and, and anyway, it, it it was very helpful. So I, I thank my model for for her demonstration here for her help. Um, so the good news through uh, through this is that they don't need surgery the far majority of the time. Lateral epicondylitis can be cured by with conservative approach. If it's early on, rest it. Listen, this is your body telling you there's something wrong. It's like a dashboard of a car. There's a little light going off. What does that mean? There's something wrong. Oil's low. Something's going on. This is your body telling you something is overstressed. There's micro tears in the lateral aspect of the tendon called extensor carpal radialis brevis. There's overstress. Generally, it's not an inflammatory condition. When we do a biopsy of the tissue that we take out, we rarely see acute inflammatory cells. So this is your body telling you rest it. So what's the treatment? Rest. Don't do the activities that's provoking it. So we tell them not to do those activities, whether it's rotating pipes or turning screws all day or playing tennis. Two, we want to give them a course of anti-inflammatories. Which anti-inflammatories? It doesn't matter. They all work the same. Okay, not one is better than the other. Ibuprofen, uh, 600, 800 milligram TID, uh, Naproxen, if you want to go the expensive route, Celebrex, that's fine. They, they all work, except the only thing is that I don't like to give it to them intermittently. I like to give them a course, a whole week course. So provocative test, avoid, ANSAID, and what? And a splint. I like the wrist splints. The uh, forearm straps can be helpful, but I've also used, uh, seen them used where the patients have concomitant radial tunnel syndrome. What happens when they have that? You make the situation worse by pressing against the nerve. So don't use forearm straps if they have radial tunnel syndrome, okay? Then what's the other treatment? Therapy, that can be helpful. Expensive, but it can be helpful. And, and the other conservative measure is cortisone injection. That approach will cure about 85 to 90% of the people. Unfortunately, as much as 40% of those will have reoccurrence or some mild to moderate pain. So they'll need more treatment in the future. For those who end up needing surgery, the results are good. Now, the literature talks about, you know, 40% uh, doing very well, complete relief, 40% mild to moderate, and 20% failure. Uh, I don't see that. If 20% of my patients came back tell me how much I stink, I'd be a plumber tomorrow. I mean, that would be incredibly stressful. I wouldn't operate on lateral condylitis if that's the case. So I think the results, if done right, are well over 95% to 98%. Uh, their surgery is, 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 I like to keep a simple approach. I go down, I incise the, the, the tendon, I debride the uh, unhealthy tissue, shave a little bit of the bone and close it. Literally a 12 minute case. I'm not a big advocate of complexity, you know, where you're doing a scope for something here. It